it's kind of one of the places where it doesn't matter what you're doing, obviously, <laughs> um, people are going to be okay with it and let you just do your thing. So. Same way, it's just very serene and it's quiet and it's beautiful. The setting is absolutely gorgeous. And we were talking about the butterflies earlier and how we always see butterflies here. And I think that it's just the perfect setting for just relaxation or even just reading and studying. I really like the sculpture garden because it has all these interesting anecdotes about how um, Chancellor uh, Murphy uh, kind of envisioned this garden and, and came to see it um, develop, but then also at the same time, I really like the sculpture garden's idea of being um, a quote-unquote modern sculpture garden and, and what that means. Franklin Murphy was originally a, a medical doctor. He was a passionate enthusiast of arts and letters. He was only chancellor for eight years, from 1960 to 1968, but under his chancellorship, 18 buildings were added to UCLA. When Franklin Murphy set out to start this collection, they decided that instead of having a painting collection that was uh, something to be housed inside a museum, they would instead have an outdoor collection and that it would be uh, known for its works of sculpture and that could be seen really by everybody all the time. The garden currently has, I believe, 72 sculptures and when it first opened, I think it had something closer to 40. But all of those that uh, it opened with and that have been given in, the, in subsequent years were all donations by major collectors. If you can imagine this site where we're standing being a dirt parking lot that is completely flat and it's called the Fairweather parking lot because when it rained it filled with mud. And it's a five acre site surrounded by these five buildings which include social sciences, the research library, and a couple of other buildings including the art building. In 1967 this was this, like I said, dirt parking lot where Franklin Murphy, who was chancellor at the time, imagined having a sculpture garden. And he was very influenced by the sort of great cities of Europe and these great civic plazas and their sculpture collections and wanted to bring that kind of experience to UCLA students and the community. And it was very important for him to have the highest quality art available to students. So he embarked upon this with the cooperation of a lot of Los Angeles collectors, the regents, and a very enthusiastic group of supporters. All this flat parking lot, this dirt, was turned into this incredible area that you see now, which includes this large civic plaza space, this broad open flat space, uh, this alley of trees, this long narrow space where sculptures are sort of enclosed by this kind of tunnel of trees, and then this broad rolling hills expanse, this kind of pastoral aspect of the garden. So you have these three different kinds of places. You walk through it on your, your daily strolls through campus and thousands and thousands of people come through this garden every day. And many of them stop, many of them find a place to study, many of them find a corner where no one bothers them. Some of them are laying around on the grass. And that was the idea, was to not have a place that was sort of sealed off. It's something defined but yet still very open and accessible. One of the fantastic things about the Sculpture Garden is the way the concrete benches and spaces are put together in the natural surrounding. And I think this is what the designer of the garden was masterful at, creating these like rooms where you could sit on uh, a bench, you could eat lunch, talk to someone, have a kind of intimate, um, almost room-like feeling outside. And that's one of the special things about this garden is the, uh, the seating and the, uh, the pathways that lead you to these different uh, sort of enclosed areas. A lot of students are studying here. There's benches and enclaves that are kind of made for that purpose for students to kind of stop and then take a break in their day or, or do some reading. Um, a lot of students will sit beside the sculptures instead of um, study along with them. So that's kind of interesting as well. Many of the works, again, in the garden, they weren't created for this garden specifically, but they also may not have been created for the outdoors. This is David Smith's Q by 20, and it dates to 1964, 
and it's a welded stainless steel piece. Many other works in the garden, as you might notice, are cast bronze and it just exist in multiple uh, versions, multiple casts. And this is one of the works that was in the garden originally when it was founded in 1967, came with a bequest from David Bright. And it's one of the most uh, significant works in the garden for many reasons. One of the interesting things that I find about it is that David Smith created his sculptures to be outdoors. These four bronze sculptures are by the French artist Henri Matisse, and they were actually conceived by the artist over a 20-year period. And he didn't necessarily think about them as a series, but rather an evolution of a theme. You see that it starts out with a fairly realistic portrait of a woman from the back with this kind of bun on her hair, and then it starts to get broken down into various sort of geometric shapes the, f the farther you go along with this process. This is a sculpture by the American artist Deborah Butterfield, and it dates to 1996, and it's actually the most recent addition to the Murphy Sculpture Garden. And in addition to that, it actually was created specifically for the garden. She works specifically uh, in this genre. She creates sculptures of horses. This was, one is called Pensive, and she's created this horse by casting in bronze different pieces of driftwood and then assembling them into this sculpture. And what I find particularly interesting about it is it's almost like it seems like the structure of an interior of a skeleton, but it represents the kind of the outside figure of this horse. This is the last work that was added to the garden and we don't plan to add any more. We consider it a completed collection because of the sort of balance of the landscape and the sculpture and the ability to sit and relax in the garden and have this open space. We feel like it's reached that right kind of ratio. It's made me sensitive to both the high quality of this particular sculpture garden, but it's also caused me to take second looks at different sculptures around uh, Los Angeles that were put in at about the same time as the Murphy Sculpture Garden, 60s, early 70s. It's a, um, perhaps it's a unique moment in the idea of putting abstract sculptures in front of buildings or in parks. And that's one of the great things about the Murphy Sculpture Garden. There are these strange, almost abstract expressionist works in a natural setting. Curators of sculpture collections come when they're planning a garden because it's known as this incredibly successful model of one that's uh, not a traditional museum garden, not a traditional campus sculpture collection, but one that combines great elements of both. And so I think it's, it's very unique in that way. It's also unique in the high quality of the works in this collection. And again, that's something that Franklin Murphy, it was so important to him not to have second-rate work uh, available to students, but to have only the best works. The Sculpture Garden represents a moment, a kind of optimistic moment in terms of city planning, uh, campus planning, um, philanthropy, putting art in public spaces that I think is really, it's great to see and it's you know, one of the most remarkable sculpture gardens in America.